And there we go. So uh, with any luck, this meeting is being recorded. Good evening and welcome to Know Before You Grow, a committee of Petaluma Urban Chat. I'm Dan Like. I drew the short straw, so I host, but as always, thanks to Sharon Kirk and Dave Alden for doing the heavy lifting. This evening's presentation on transit-oriented development is part of our series on issues pertinent to the rework of Petaluma's general plan, a process which is going on right now. But before we get to that, a few housekeeping notes. On October 13th, we're going to do a Know Before You Grow with a presentation from city staff on considering vehicle miles traveled when evaluating new developments and how we can encourage developments which have fewer vehicle miles traveled. Uh, we have been Zoom bombed in the past. We will undoubtedly be Zoom bombed again. If things get weird, uh, strange music, swastikas being drawn over presentations, whatever, hang loose until I kick out the miscreants and we'll carry on. If you're trying to join the meeting after the starting time, please respond to my chat questions to you. I'm trying to do a little vetting because of the Zoom bombing and usernames like ho, 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 don't give me a lot of confidence. So if you know someone having trouble getting, getting in, uh, tell me who they are and let's have a little communication over that. We have participants who are subject to the Brown Act and have concerns about serial public meetings, which means that appointed and elected public elected public officials are thinking about that before they participate. We respect that caution. Which also brings me to, we've uh, gonna run a little more locked down this evening than we have been in the past. Last session, the chat room had quite a bit of misinformation and misinterpretation in it. And I wasn't able to both pay attention to the content of the presentation, be aware of questions for the Q&A and all the general operation and muting things and try to address some of the misinformation that we had going on. So out of respect for our speakers and me getting what I want out of the session, the chat's a little more locked down. Questions come straight to me rather than being generally available. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ed Edminster with the caveat that I may mute people um, without warning if I hear noise from them in the background, uh, toilets flushing and whatnot. Uh, so if you're muted, it's especially if you're a speaker, it's nothing personal. Uh, please unmute yourself and carry on. And the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Dan. Can you hear me okay? All right. Excellent. So I want to welcome everyone here tonight and offer a really a resounding thank you to our speakers, Monica Mayer and Doug Farr, for agreeing to join us tonight. I will introduce them in the order in which they will appear. Um, Monica is uh, spent close to a decade working in sustainability and is a sustainability project manager presently at BART. In this role, she uh, works across many areas, including energy efficiency, electric vehicles, as well as working closely with the TOD, otherwise known as Transit Oriented Development Group. And as you all know, TOD is the topic this evening. Following Monica is Doug Farr. Doug is a longtime friend and colleague of mine. We met in connection with development of LEED, working with the US Green Building Council when um, I was chairing the Lead for Homes Committee and Doug was chairing the Lead for Neighborhood Development Committee. So we had lots of opportunity to collaborate and commiserate and <laughs> many other things. Doug is deemed one of Planet as In's 100 most influential urbanists of all time, is a legend in his own right. He co-chaired the development, as I mentioned, of USGBC's Lead for Neighborhood Development Program as well as having served on the boards of urban sustainability organizations, including Congress for the New Urbanism, Bioregional Eco Districts, and Elevate Energy. Based on his pioneering sustainable design practice, in 2008, Doug authored the urban planning bestseller, Sustainable Urbanism, Urban Design with Nature. He released a new follow-up called Sustainable Nation, Urban Design Patterns for the Future in 2018. Doug's insights have been celebrated internationally and he speaks regularly at world-class events and in Petaluma. <laughs> so welcome to our speakers and Monica, take it away. All right, thank you, Anne, and thank you for having me today. I am going to, or tonight, let me just share my screen here and bring my presentation up. 
All right. Great. Um, so as Anne said, I am a sustainability project manager at BART. I've been in transportation for only about a year and a half now, but I've been working in sustainability for close to a decade. Uh, when I was getting my MBA at Presidio Graduate School, I actually did a project on SMART before they were uh, started service. And so that was actually my introduction to uh, transit before moving over to BART. So today I want to bring the transit agency perspective around TOD and how we both work with cities uh, and engage communities. Before diving in, I do want to set some context and talk a little bit more broadly about, you know, TOD at BART. Uh, our board adopted a TOD policy in 2005, which we updated again in 2016 and uh, last year in 2020, but we have been focusing on TOD well before then. And I'll talk later on about how important community engagement is in this process. In addition to the TOD policy, we also have an affordable housing policy which requires that 20% of units be affordable, even though our goal is 35%. And something to note with this policy is it requires that 20% of the units, um, of the total proposed housing units on the property are affordable, regardless of the planned phasing of the project. So how that plays out is that if a TOD project is gonna be multiple buildings, multiple phases, uh, often, if there's one that's specifically for affordable housing, you'll see that that one gets built first. Um, the policy is available on our website if you want to look at that more. And then just a note too, that 35% goal, that's actually district-wide, not site-specific. So the 20% goal is for the site, but the 35% is, is for um, our entire district. So BART, BART has completed 13 GOD projects to date. We have four under construction right now and seven approved projects in the pipeline. This slide that I'm showing right now, this was our first TOD project back in 1993. Uh, it achieved 100% affordable units. Um, you can see the little map, I included that below because I find it kind of amusing that the, you know, the development has this huge parking lot in between the development and the station. Somewhat tongue in cheek with that though, because you'll notice that part of this also included the, the, his, the renovation of the Strobe Ridge House. So we, we didn't have as much flexibility with where to place the development. Now, um, additionally, we own 250 acres at 27 stations that could accommodate future development. And this is largely surface parking lots. That's, that's what we mainly target for doing our TOD development. Um, in the past, before I joined the sustainability group, there was sometimes tension between sustainability and TOD because uh, sustainability would look at these surface lots and say, we want to put solar there. You know, this is a great, great place to do on-site solar. Um, you know, since then, with, with kind of the, the change in the group, we realized that the most sustainable thing that BART can be doing is TOD. And we can try to encourage TOD that includes solar and, and EV charging. Uh, we definitely don't want to conflict with, with TOD. Staying just a bit longer on the sustainable benefits of TOD and specifically the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the Transportation Resource Board released a white paper in July that was titled Public Transit as a Climate Solution. And one of the salient points is the concept of land use efficiency, which found that even residents who do not ride transit themselves save vehicle uh, miles traveled, such as you know, through taking shorter, shorter trips or having fewer driving trips. So, you know, I, I think when, when we think about TOD, we think about, oh, those residents are gonna be taking transit all the time and that really reduces greenhouse gas emissions. And so I think it was great through this research that they found, even if these people aren't taking transit, they still are traveling less and still reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So getting a little bit more into the specifics, uh, we do have a 70 page TOD guideline that provides clarity around BART's expectations when we do TOD both with in our property and our larger station area. Um, that's also available on our website if anyone wants to dig into that more. I'll try to summarize some of the more relevant points for Petaluma today. Um, 
one of one of the important points to start with is you know, we have a best practice to only solicit projects for development in areas that have sub transit supportive land use regulations. So just to back up a bit, BART owns the land around our stations, uh, the parking lots, and we are our own AHJ. And so we could develop very dense affordable housing with no parking. You know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, that, that, that is an option that's available. But rather than doing that and kind of forcing cities and counties to accept the developments, we found that it's best to work with them and have support. Um, and we find the most support in the cities and counties that already have transit supportive land use regulations in place. And so some of these regulations include a minimum net density, um, having no minimum target uh, parking requirement, encouraging parking management and bundling of the parking from the units, uh, supporting affordable housing, which also aligns with our policy, and then assuring walkable streets and active transportation improvements. So in addition to looking for those regulations before we solicit developments, uh, we also work with cities and communities to understand their goals and how the development can help support them. So, you know, again, we're not just trying to do as much housing or office space as possible. We also want to create greener communities. So looking at sustainability and more walkable spaces that offer community amenities and services. And this can take many forms. So, you know, we could be looking at affordable that is low or very low income households. Um, supportive services for residents with special needs or childcare services on site, having you know the appropriate civic uses such as open space for farmers markets, and making sure that we establish an appropriate scale of, of retail to increase walkability. And, and these examples come from actual TOD projects that, that we've completed. So in addition to working with cities, we also want to work with the developer to develop a community process that engages the community throughout the process. And that input from the community will inform development, design, and delivery to make sure that it meets the community's goals, objectives, and expectations. So depending on when we last met with the community to, to talk about development in the station area, we will work with them before um, we solicit a development. And then community members will also be updated throughout the project refinement stage. So for example, in West Oakland, which is one of our TOD projects that is under development right now, we have had a few different community engagement meetings, but the developer also works specifically with a community-based organization um, to help you know, provide the community voice throughout the process. So there's kind of two different avenues for community engagement. Also, additionally, our board meetings are open to the public. So that's always an avenue and our board is very open to feedback um, and public comment. And, and last point to make um, is, you know, I, I think it's obvious, but I do think it's important to state that, you know, the developer leading the project makes a big difference too. So, you know, historically, BART has worked with developers who have a lot of experience with affordable housing. It's always been one of our priorities. Um, and community engagement, the sustainability group is hoping that we can also elevate developers who have experience with sustainability beyond just LEED. And, you know, so for an example of this, uh, the California Energy Commission just put forward a grant um, for solar and storage for affordable housing. And developers who are comfortable and used to working with the CEC and seeking these type of grants, they can really help accelerate sustainability at TOD beyond just, you know, following building code, um, you know, Cal Green and, and, you know, doing LEED certification. So really looking for developers who, you know, can help BART meet our goals, as well as align with both what works for the city and the community. And with that, I will turn it back over to Anne. Thank you. And you are muted. You might want to unmute yourself. Oh, whoops, sorry, too many buttons to press. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. 
Um, we're going to hold Q&A until after Doug, so that it will be more of a blended Q&A covering both presentations. And so, Doug, you are up. Well, thank you, Anne. Let's see. Okay. It's going to take me a minute, kids. There we go. All right. So thank you, that was lovely. I'm so glad you did a great job and covered all the stuff that I didn't get to prepare for. So um, can you guys see my screen? Can you see a screen? Yes. You see the screen you wanna see or other screens? I, I am seeing an overview. There we go, full screen presentation okay. mode. <laughs> okay, so, um, so thank you. So I just, uh, Ann, Ann and Dave know this, I was on a, boat cruise tonight um, on the Chicago River, and it was really lovely, but the boat came in 45 minutes late. So um, all the time I left in my day to prepare, um, you're seeing it in real time. So anyway, um, good evening. Thanks for having me. Uh, dear old friend of Anne's from forever ago. And um, just hang on. There we go. So. Um, I was sent some examples of TOD in Petaluma, and it struck me that they were uh, not where they should be. So um, since I've been, I've had three cocktails and two glasses of wine and not enough food, I just thought I'd sort of go for it. So, um, and I'm also the out of town guy, so I don't really know any of the people involved, so I can speak my mind and this is um, a favor anyway. So anyway, but why, why is it so primitive? Why, you know, it's California, it's the, Burning Shores, The Golden Door, it's, it's all the things in the Grateful Dead songs. Why, why is it so primitive? So, so anyway, who the heck is this guy talking? So uh, as Ann said, Architects Planner has been at it 30 years and really been trying to push um, on both the urban scale um, and the building scale on sustainability. Um, I got a book, uh, you know, buy it if you want, or buy it if you can't sleep. But it changed my life, the act of writing that book. And so just real quick, um, this is my kind of carbon urgency pitch. So here's the chart for CO2 reduction and here's the rate at which we should decarbonize our world. So I wanna take a kind of quick poll of the room. Uh, when do you think the United States is likely to basically decarbonize? 2030, 2050, 2070, 2090? Put it in the chat, please, A, B, C, D. And I'll let that voting thing go on. Um, in Sustainable Nation, we did a comparison to say, you know, there isn't really any way to know this, but you can compare to other things that we have as a society have um, uh, reversed. And smoking cessation is the best example. So hopefully this clicks through. It doesn't seem to be clicking through. There we go. Correct answer is the letter G, which is the year 2150. So if we decarbonize at the rate we quit smoking cigarettes, there's the two lines, there's the slopes, read it, read it and weep, kids. So we're going about it really slowly. Um, and this is not to depress you, it is to inspire you. Uh, TOD is a part of that, but TOD is a very slow moving train. It moves in generations. Um, you know, every TOD we've been involved in after 25 years is still at most two thirds done. So the pace of TOD and the pace of decarbonization, you know, are um, sort of mismatched. So why I mention all this is to say, getting the TODs that are in the pipeline in Petaluma right now, we don't get a second bite out of it to get it wrong once and tear it down and wait 50 years. So it should be all electric, fossil fuel light or fossil fuel non-existent uh, and highly walkable and you're, we're a long ways from that. So in Sustainable Nation, we uh, you've all seen the examples where you talk about sort of case studies like who else has done it better somewhere? Let's go, you know, either visit or read about it. So we've called these pilgrimage sites. And it's the idea that oftentimes um, you, you make the, tr the effort, the sacrifice to go see a place, it really burns its, burns its way into your head. So these are sort of pilgrimage sites. This is a TOD that our firm designed in 1999. It's in normal Illinois. And when your town is called normal Illinois, you gotta hard, try a lot harder. So. So what did they do? Uh, made a, this sort of beautiful circle, very inclusive. It's a, the nation's first circular intersection. That's a story. Uh, water, you know, air conditioning is you put your feet in the fountain um, and uh, very honored that it's gotten a slew of awards, but it is a place. And behind 
behind this image here is the Amtrak station. Here it is from the air. So circular, kind of a conservative Midwestern brick aesthetic. That was just kind of where central Illinois was. Here's the Amtrak station over on the left and the circle. And this is the Sweet Corn Festival every summer. And I show this to say it's a place and people want to be there. And there's, it's not all one size. It's not all one building height. Public, shape, public space has been shaped uh, and so on. So here's the plan, you get it. Um, here's another project that is just kind of iconic in my world. I was uh, lucky enough to get a German Marshall Fund traveling fellowship in 1998, right before we planned Uptown Normal. And I got to see Vauban in Germany. And I was a young, younger, much younger architect and wanted to do green buildings and things that had solar panels. I didn't really know where, what that was or where that was going. And I went to Vauban. I went, took a pilgrimage to, Va to see Vauban in Freiburg, Germany. And oh my gosh, it was the place that did a net zero neighborhood. And it was technically possible and it existed and I saw it and it was unforgettable and I couldn't not know about it. So anyway, Vauban is that example. And so you can see it's kind of that kind of messy German eco, you know, you can just see the Birkenstocks and, and the whole thing. It's not like a, it's not like a staple gun, chip, 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 chip. They're all the same. Like they're all slightly different. They're all kind of quirky and personable and like individuals you would meet, uh, you know, on a bus or in church or uh, at, the, at the beach, whatever. So anyway, quirky, human touch, right? And here it is from the air. And uh, this was, I saw it in 98. I think that's about when, no, maybe it was, it must've been finished a couple of years before. So anyway, uh, solar panels everywhere, the whole thing. And so um, I noticed one of the TODs in, in uh, Petaluma had solar panels. So it's not like people don't get it a little bit, but there's no going for it spirit. So, and here it is, you know, colorful. I mean, it looks like Europe, right? Colorful panels and architecture and whatever, but this is, you know, 20, not quite 25 years ago. So that was progressive. I expect this from California people. I live in Chicago, it's conservative here. You're not conservative. You should just, you should go for it, go for it. What are you waiting for? So, so rather than just show a bunch of case studies, um, one of the things we did in Sustainable Nation was propose patterns. And if you've heard of Chris Alexander's book, Pattern Language, this is in that spirit. So the subtitle of the book, Sustainable Nation, Urban Design Patterns for the Future. So I'm just gonna flash a few uh, patterns in front of you. And then we're gonna show you a couple of quick uh, examples from Petaluma and you be the judge of whether we're thinking in a forward, you know, forward facing manner or kind of recycling stuff from the 20th century. So, um, you know, density. So first, my first reaction to the Petaluma projects is they're too short. Um, certainly three and four stories is great and walkable. My, I'm in downtown Chicago tonight after the boat cruise um, my office is on the sixth floor. I take the stairs every day. Um, in ancient Rome, there were walk-ups at the eighth and ninth floor. So, um, you know, at 15 floors, I think people don't take the stairs, but at four and six and seven and eight, they do and can. So I think more density would be okay. This is contributed by Jason um, uh, McClendon, this Steve Muzan is the wrong name, um, who founded the Living Building Challenge. And so his sweet spot was four to eight stories. And you look at uh, Houseman's Parish, you look at uh, Vienna, uh, you know, Upper West Side of New York, um, they're taller than many of the buildings you're seeing in Petaluma. Uh, buildings that have a base, middle, and top, uh, subtitle goes here, um, separate the parking from the housing. This is a beautiful diagram design drawn by a California architect, uh, John Ellis of uh, Solomon uh, Methune in San Francisco, and basically makes the case there is a matrix of um, across the top is sort of one-to-one -one parking, 0.5 to one parking and 0.25 to one parking. And the density goes up. And then these little numbers down here are the ones to pay attention to compared to a just detached single family. How does the cost factor go down? And what you find is down here at 45 dwelling units of the acre, if you can reduce the parking, the housing just got a lot less expensive because you're not building a lot of parking. And so uh, and there are pockets of the world where this is completely possible. But anyway, I still see in the Petaluma examples kind of pushing for excessive parking and it's embedded in the project in a way that you can't extract it or, or change your mind in five or 10 years when 
the technology is, you know, providing mobility as a service rather than an object you own. So anyway, you kind of get the picture there. Let me keep going. Um, second chapter is theater of life. Um, how can we make our play neighborhoods places we never want to leave? When you see the Petaluma examples, what will, we, what will you feel? You will want to leave them. You'll want to leave them. So like that's a, that's a measure of failure. So um, this is a, a kind of an, from our friend Emily Town, professor of University of Chicago and urbanism. But it's basically your, everyone needs an, a spatial unit that they call home, that they identify with. And so, you know, here's the attributes of it. Do you feel like you, does it have a name? Do you feel like you belong? Does it have a center? Do you know where the edge is? Does it have diversity of uses? This is the classic planning diagram of the last 150 years. Uh, Ebenezer Howard had, um, um, and so on, sort of everybody since. So, so uh, you know, think of it as places, not as uh, you know, developments adjacent to a future transit stop. So, have a third place. Where's the place that I, I live in your neighborhood, but I don't know that many people. And how do I meet people? Third place is that magic thing. You could it could be based on pets, kids, coffee, alcohol, and probably other other California-based accelerants. Uh, would work uh, to support a third place. So is there a third place in any of these plans that were sent to me? I, if there were, you know, it's pretty hard to discern. So I'm um, sorry, this, I grabbed an old PowerPoint. <clears throat> um, this is from Patrick Kennedy, if you know him in San Francisco, developer of uh, Panoramic, his company's Panoramic Interests, San Francisco, Berkeley-based developer. Um, micro units, you know, where's down at the smallest end of unit size, like, why aren't there any micro units being proposed in parallel? We say, oh, that's only in San Francisco. BS, people like, some people like that sort of uh, distilled uh, distilled lifestyle. So um, here's one, turn strangers into neighbors by diversifying dwelling types in each building. So if you have a multifamily building, do you have some efficiencies, ones, twos, and threes, or is it all twos, right? So you're gonna get a very homogeneous family type if you don't have a diversity of unit types. So that's what that's about. And this is a beautiful work by, again, a California firm, Mool Polyzoides from, um, from uh, where are they from? Uh, Pasadena. Um, and so here's their beautiful California courtyard housing. So this is, you know, inventive. Somebody spent money on design. The designer they hired had complex ideas. They translated into beautiful forms. So I don't see any evidence of that in the, in the uh, Petaluma examples. Um, you, you do just gorgeous projects, I'll just let them speak for themselves. The Del Mar station, if people aren't familiar with it, um, is just gorgeous. And so, you know, a variety of buildings, they've used color and massing to appear to make it many, many buildings, but I think it's one sort of large interconnected sort of spider web of a building. Architecture, massing, urbanism, color, and then this crazy thing where the train actually goes under the building. Well, can you do that? Yes, you can. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then this one, mix residential building types within every block. So again, when you see the Petaluma examples, you don't see this. And this is again, another California idea. This is from our friends at uh, uh, Opticos in Berkeley, Dan Parola. So these are examples, you know, single family house, a lower density thing. Um, the end of a block, urban blocks matter. You can put different building types at different positions on a block. Um, you know, commercial quarters, you can have that as part of a block. All of those things are absent in the examples that were sent to me. Um, and then here's another one for you. I believe this is actually pretty important, which is the idea that each building should have one architectural style. And that may seem like, well, of course, but look at the examples we're gonna see in a minute. You cannot tell, there's a pastiche of generic balcony with generic rooftop, with generic, I don't know what style it is. I wouldn't be able to classify it. Um, and so you say, so what? It's just developer housing. Well, I'll just say when some of the best places, and this is one, this, uh, this uh, pattern came from a project outside of Atlanta, Georgia called Serenby, which is a kind of made up word, which is, uh, uh, the agglomeration of serenity and B. So B serene, ser seren B. But their whole MO is that every building has one distinct architectural style. So this is, this is buildings on a block. So there's kind of a, 
colonial. This is more kind of a mountain thing. Uh, but they have a Corbusian building. They have a Mesian building. They have it, and it's lovely. And you're walking along, it's like take in this complete work of art that is this house or building. Um, and so what you get in Petaluma, in the example sent to me, a pastiche, or worse yet, 40 buildings designed by the same architect with where a variety, you know, a, a left and a right mirroring passes for diversity. So pathetic, pathetic, primitive. You know, you saw the beginning of 2001 with the, the bone and the ape kind of knocking the bone and, you know, it's kind of where we are. So TOD and Petaluma. So here's uh, what architectural style might these be? Just, it's just a question. So where's the special third place? Where do we go when, uh, when uh, uh, it's the 4th of July or our team won, won a sports event or, our candidate won an election, where do you go? I guess it's this little squiggle park down by the train tracks, right? Not a place, not a place. Uh, this is the actual site. So I understand it's constrained and there are a lot of missing cues. There's a creek on one edge. There isn't, there aren't streets to connect to. So, um, you know, the designer didn't have a lot of thing, a lot of hooks that they could sink their plan into, but there we go. Um, here's another one. This is Parking, uh, half the site is parking, half the site is standalone buildings. Here we go. So the, the architect designed it once and did lefts and rights, right? And where's, where's the human delight? Where's the, where's the reward for walking 100 feet or 500 feet or 1,000 feet? I can't wait to see the architectural style in the next building. You've seen it already 10 times. Just go turn around and go home. There's no point to walk here. It's all the same. So it's just, it's squeezed out of a toothpaste tube. So we can ask for better. So, and the teams, the teams that do this, you know, I don't know, you deserve better. Petaluma, I, I checked you out. You're pretty good. So, um, and you know, the renderings, they're kind of nice. They're sort of soft and pastel-y kind of, you know, the painter Deben Korn, also a Cal, he was from Illinois, but he moved to California. But anyway, sort of a nice Deben Korn palette, kind of a soft touch, but um, rewarding to the pedestrian, the best street you've ever walked on, uh, not hardly. So um, anyway, here, and then here's Haystack. It's called Haystack uh, with a kind of new Bavarian architecture. I don't know what the connection between Bavaria and Haystack is, but um, you know, again, you deserve better. And just those are the kind of fun, cheap shots that you can take when you've been um, out on a boat and drinking. Um, but more, more substantively, I do think, I look forward to the questions and I think Anne and David have other have questions to pose. Um, and I'm just the out of town or I'm Anne's friend, glad to do this. Um, but I really do, the thing I wanna say sort of with great sincerity is uh, urbanism takes, normally takes too long to be relevant in our push to decarbonize, right? It's like the thing that'll go a lot faster is to swap out for electric cars and swap out for heat pumps rather than furnaces and boilers. We got to do all that, but but if you don't, you know, I'm, I don't think we're going to hit a 2050 decarb number. So we'll still be doing new land uses and adding human population. They'll be moving to California and all that kind of stuff. So we got to get it right, and we don't have the luxury of getting it wrong once. Uh, and coming back and redoing it. So I think that's kind of where I'm at and I'll end my show. And hopefully that was amusing and let's have some questions. Did, was that fun? It's kind of fun, it was fun for me, so. I, uh, the, I don't have any questions in the chat yet. I only have, love this guy. So you're doing well so far. <laughs> Where's the bar? The bar, I I can't. <laughs> too far away, too far away, yeah. Anyway, so. But yeah. Petaluma, you deserve yeah. something really yeah. special. You deserve something that's special. Anyway. Go for it, Anne. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I have some questions for both Monica and Doug. And uh, Doug, having been tremendously controversial, I think I'll start with Monica just to uh, ensure <laughs> that we hear some from her as well. So um, some things I was curious about in your presentation, Monica, I'm wondering that um, you mentioned that there's an increase in the services and livability that occurs in proximity to TODs. And I wondered if you could elaborate on 
those aspects, livability and services, because that's, of course, part of what we want to encourage. It isn't the TOD entirely for its own sake, but for what it would bring with it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Anne. So yeah, I think this was in relation to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and that not just the people living in TOD or the people taking transit are reducing emissions. Um, you know, so I think one of the examples that keeps coming to, to mind for me is uh, it, it, one of the TODs that um, we put together, there is childcare included with, with the housing. And so, you know, I think preference is given to residents, but it's not only for residents. And so if you live next door to this new development and you're looking for childcare, you can now just walk, you know, to, to this new development that um, includes the service that maybe before you had to get into your car and drive to go to. So, you know, that's just one example, but we, we see it with various types of retail, a lot of our spaces. Yeah, when Doug was talking, I was like, oh, I need to go back through my pictures to see how well Bart's been doing with all of these <laughs> <laughs> different things that he's bringing up. But I do think that we do especially think about the third place a lot, right? That open space where people can gather, you know, where cities and community groups can host different events, um, be it farmer's market, be, you know, different rallies, different activities where people can con conjugate. So, you know, it's just another example of, of how it benefits more, more than just the people who are, are living in, in the development. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned some of the mixed uses because that's another thing I was interested in with the decline of retail, you know, which of course has been ongoing for quite some time. Thank you, Amazon, and thank you, COVID. I'm curious, how are those uses faring presently in um, the BART TOD projects? So we don't manage them, right? So um, we do a land lease to the developer. So I don't actually have that information with mm -hmm. the specific development, um, you know, kind of if retail's moving out. I, I do, you know, I very intentionally tried to include some examples that weren't just housing. So, you know, the, the Ed Roberts campus at Ashby, that is um, it's a campus that has office buildings and, and space for studying and lectures. Another one that I did not include in the slide deck is uh, Workday. So the company Workday um, built on one of our sites. So the development was an office building for them. So there are a lot of options beyond just retail of how to mix space with, with housing. For the Workday example and for the, um, the Ed Roberts campus at Ashby, actually neither of those had housing. So our TOD doesn't always have housing. We have had some examples where it is, is just other use space. Uh, very interesting. Um, one other question before I switch over to and pick on Doug. <laughs> um, and that is, I noticed one of the policies was that one of the criteria BART uses in selecting development projects is uh, no minimum parking requirements. And I'm curious if you have encountered a lot of resistance among city leadership to that requirement? It's, it's definitely very controversial and we have to be very careful working with communities. And so one of the projects, um, actually a few of our projects in development right now are, so, so there's, there's two pieces of parking when we do TOD at BART to consider, right? So there's the parking for residents but you also have to keep in mind that we're developing our surface lot. So this used to be parking for transit passengers and we don't always have replacement parking for transit. And so that is what's gonna be happening at our West Oakland station. We're gonna be building buildings on all of the surface lots and we're not gonna be doing any replacement parking for passengers. So it's very much gonna change the ridership at that station because currently it's what we call um, it has a very wide catchment. It's the last station before the train goes underground into San Francisco. It's a deal for parking. So we have people who will drive from all over to take that station into the city versus taking a station that's closer to their home. So, you know, this could also tie into that land use efficiency, right? We're saying, you know, you can't park there anymore. Now you have to drive the shorter, the shorter route and take transit longer because we just took away parking. So, um, 
you know, it's, it's, I, I know I'm not fully answering your question, Anne. I, I don't know if, if there's like a delicate soundbite to put around it. I would just say that we, not just TOD, we also have our station access policy, which deprioritizes parking and investments in parking, especially at our urban stations. And so, you know, in general, we are really looking at how do we get people to walk, to bike and take buses to transit. And if that means not replacing parking or just having very minimal parking at TOD, that's something that, that we're comfortable with. Wow, that's really, really fascinating. Um, I, uh, Monica and I share having residents in Pacifica. The, I, in the past, and Monica at present, and of course that made us drivers to BART. And uh, it's it's a really interesting phenomenon when you realize how abysmal the transit to get to some of those stations is. It's not a pretty prospect. So, um, you know, that's just a, I think one sort of very personal illustration of, you know, the challenges of retrofitting or shoehorning TOD into our existing really um, lacking development patterns. So thank you for that. Um, Dan, before I pick on, on Doug, actually, do you have any questions in the Q&A that would fit into this part of the flow? Um, we, I think we have one for Doug, but let's start with the one for Monica, which is John asks, at BART stations, are people using more personal transport port, ah, I can talk really. Are people using more personal transport from or to home offices like uh, scooters and folding bikes? Um, that's that's a great question. We've definitely seen an increase. Um, you know, we have been putting a we we work with um, is it Bay Wheels? There's that has the electric bike stations near our station, so we do work to try to make sure that that's available. I will say one piece with. TOD and station access that we see, there is a difference between how far people are willing to walk when they're getting from their home to the station versus from the station to their destination, right? And so um, I believe people are willing to walk more from their house to the station versus the other end. And so we try to really think about with TOD how, so that's why this workday example is really relevant because now you have your office building right there. And so you just get off the train and you're at work. And so that's much more motivating to people than the other way around. Interesting. And uh, Barry comments that he visited the BART TOD Fruitvale station and it informed him greatly. So good Great. work there, I think. All and right. back to you and we'll toss George's comment over to uh, Doug when we get there. Okay. Super. Um, so, uh, Doug. Um, yes, Anne. If you had to pinpoint one pivotal planning mechanism to unlock TOD and its benefits to livability and carbon reduction, what would it be? What level should we be pressing on first, most often, and hardest? Uh, recognizing that, as you said, this is a long play. Yeah. Who's, whose question is this? Mine. Oh, you scoundrel. <laughs> the put your finger on the one thing. So, um, well, I actually think the, the longest legacy of TOD is designed. To, first of all, before I answer that, I want to thank Monica because you, you nailed it. So I didn't have to say anything serious because you got everything right and the policy was spot on. And so thank you for taking the pressure off. So I can be the court jester. Um, but in terms of TOD, you know, uh, that carbon and that climate thing, is anyone here interested in kind of the carbon climate concern? Because, um, you know, I sit astride the kind of green building side where we're trying to, in our practice in Chicago, turn out net zero buildings, decarbonize them, all electric in a climate that it's hard to do, the technology is getting there, all that kind of stuff. But that, you know, a building project can take two to five years. A TOD project can take, you know, 25 to 75 years. And so the need we have is to kind of get the carbon out in a shorter, sometime be more than 10 years, but less than a generation. And so you say, well, should we just not do TOD at all? Because it's sort of 
timeline irrelevant. And so I, I don't think the species will go away after 2050 and the January 1st, 2051, when we missed our targets, it's not like we cease to exist as a species or cease to exist as a society. So I think design would be my single best thing. Um, there's, you know, California is leading the way in terms of plenty of regulations about electrification, decarbonization, mandatory net zero ready in terms of the buildings and the architecture. So your rules are sort of taking care of that. But I, you know, the thing I saw in all the projects you sent was who the hell designed this? Did anybody design this? Like, it's kind of pretty, it's vanilla. It's, you know, you design it once, stamp it out. Uh, we'll do a left and a right and we'll change the colors a couple of times. That's, that's just cynical, it's just awful. So um, you deserve better. And so, um, you know, regulatory wise, you can, you know, a lot of towns will put the fig leaf on it and say, we'll have an architectural review committee, which you probably have. Um, and they, you know, at push for diverse facades when all the building types are all the same. So you could steal some of these patterns and say you shall have multiple building types on a single block, right? Missing middle was, uh, you know, kind of popularized by the Parolex in Berkeley. You should require that. Like every TOD should have, you know, X number of uh, different housing types and building types, unit types, price points, the whole thing. That alone would go a long way. And you know, some architect would get hold of it and try and homogenize it and make every building look the same when internally all the units were diverse. Well, that'd be a fool, foolish thing to, to happen. It may happen. But so I would just say design is probably the single uh, best thing. And in terms of there are lots of California firms that are just great at this. You know, Move Polyzoides, Solomon have mentioned, Calthorpe, uh, Opticos, you know, they're all, I'm sure you all know them. So uh, get better designers because nobody's designing this stuff. They're just like, laid out by engineers. <laughs> pathetic, pathetic. Okay. If so... any of the architects are on the call, you know, I love you, but <laughs> just, just say it, right? Yeah. And I think that went a good long way toward uh, answering George's question. So, Which and is... I've got a few more. Well, it was, how do we, um, how do we demand better from better design from developers and that was what Doug was addressing. Yeah. Well, yeah. is there are there any developers on the Zoom? Because you know, nothing better than moving from the armchair to the to the quarterback position and just doing it yourself. Like if the other guy's not doing it right, just do it. You know, I don't know. Anyway, I'm sure you have more. Yes. So Anne, I don't want to take things from you, but I've got now I've got a couple of questions queued up. Dave asks, I'm hopeful in the future will there be a, a greater market for walkable retail than today? Is there a route to building spaces today that can be banked as something else, such as housing and later converted to retail? Monica, you want to go first? Or you want to go second? It, yeah, there's there's a couple examples that I'm thinking of. You know, one one example in Richmond, um, we have it's actually kind of a co-working space, kind of a, a maker's hub that could convert to retail or back. So like that's one option to think of. And then just something else that sparked for me, this is very future long-term thinking. We have certain requirements with how we build our parking garages. So while I mentioned that right now our TOD is all around our surface lots, we try to design our parking garages in a way that in the future, those could be switched over into buildings. So that's just kind of, how do you take this long-term thinking, make it relevant now, um, and then kind of keep that flexibility? So I, I know that doesn't fully answer the question, but just kind of two thoughts that, that came out of that question. That's great. I'll just, I'll yes and uh, Monica and say, um, I, we, I, there's a couple other patterns in Sustainable Nation about, um, development ready parking. And as you've said, you know, laying out parking lots to the scale of building footprints makes a lot of sense. Um, the other thing is when you see a lot of sort of sprawly big box conditions, um, and there's a great case study in um, Gaithersburg, Maryland, a project called Kentlands, which was designed in 1986 by DPZ, where it was a series of big boxes. That was kind of what the demand, the land use demand was but they gridded all the streets and insisted that all the utilities be put under the future streets. And so um, if you don't do that, every big box store gets a 
sewer line that goes right to the kind of pump room and it's none of it makes sense. You have to rip everything out when this big box fails and you want it to now be a walkable urban block. So they should have set the bones of the place uh, to tolerate a generation or more of kind of dopey big box that can get swapped out without having to rip out the infrastructure. So that's one. And then again, another kind of Bay Area thinker, um, no, no, one le no, no, no less than Stuart Brandt um, had uh, the book called What Buildings, uh, Buildings That Learn, How Buildings Learn, How Buildings Learn, was it? Um, and it was, you know, about a lot of things. One was, you know, how buildings evolve to have additions and as the uses and, and, and land values change, the buildings uh, adapt. But, but the, uh, the bigger idea of like the universal building type. So the cast iron district in New York started out as industrial. Uh, and then in the 80s, it was ad agencies. And now it's, you know, $10 million penthouses. Um, and you know the floor to ceiling heights are big. The floor, the spans are large, and it the use just doesn't matter. You know, and it's a building you don't have to tear down because the economy changed. So you know, again, those could be written into regulations. You know, and a lot of it would have to do with uh, taller floor to floor heights, um, probably larger spans, and it would be columnar. You know, kind of columns and beams rather than load-bearing walls, which are less universal. So, um, you know, those are kind of the longer term thinking stuff that comes to mind for me. Cool. Uh, Veronica asks, what do you suggest when there's been a legacy of developing units rather than designing places? How do we rework those spaces? So this is a suburban retrofit kind of question. And that was from who, who asked it? Veronica. And actually, Veronica, would you like to pipe in and ask your question directly? Yeah. We'll Veronica. try this. Hi, Let everyone. Rip. <laughs> no, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued and, and very happy to hear um, design as a conversation piece because it's one of my passions. And I feel that we deserve better design in this town. We are an amazing historical river town. And I love that we're starting to talk design because, um, and I think my question is around how do we attract design in our town for these incredibly important spaces that have yet to be developed like our downtown station, Corona station, et cetera. I'll, I'll go first, Monica, you tag tap in. Uh, so, you know, there are cities and uh, lots of cities that have sort of design centers. Uh, New Orleans has one, um, I think uh, Nashville or Chatt no, Chattanooga had one. So these are kind of little, start out as oftentimes as little storefronts. And so you, it's a little place and there's like a meager staff and some student interns. And then you have a lecture series and you get you know, people from out of town to show, uh, you know, pictures of alluring other places. And so you, and you invite the mayor for their comment, you invite the city council to sit in, you invite the zoning and the plan commission and, uh, and the developers. And, uh, and then if you kind of the next level up is, uh, you take the examples that were shared with me about the TUDs and you stage a redesign before it's, before it's built. So, well, you've got, you know, kind of, like row crop townhouses here with lefts and rights and kind of blues and greens and passing for diversity and, uh, you know, get somebody to really design it differently. And it'll make money. I mean, it's California, like unless, you know, unless the land is stupidly priced, it'll be fine. So, you know, I love, thank you for affirming my choice of design is the single most important thing when Anne constrained me to pick one thing. Uh, but I still think it was the right decision. And I just, I feel like if it's not in your town, you have to import it, right? And, uh, and what you're trying, what you really want is to get a des design, what do you say, kind of edge or attitude on decision, on the part of decision makers. And not everybody will get, has a visual eye or can tell, I like that better and here's why. But um, if you can make it known that other places you know, a lot of places I showed pictures of are really high value places. I don't mean the land is valuable because California has kind of got that in abundance, but, but in their sub markets, because they're more beautifully designed 
functionally designed diversity, um, they're more desirable places. And so it's, it's, it's an, a premium product uh, simply by being thoughtful. So I don't know, but I think having ideas from outside to compete with the current mediocre ideas that are kind of passing for good. Thank you very much, appreciate that. So Dan, I'd love to jump in here again, if I could for a second. All yours. Oh, great. So um, Doug, I of course completely endorse and resonate all of your comments being a design person myself, but um, you mentioned costs in California, which are actually somewhere beyond astronomical. And one of the challenges is how do you create design diversity in a context where we're not just trying to do TOD, we're trying to do affordable housing at a TOD site. And so um, of course, a more diverse design, different building types, adds cost. Um, what's your solution to that? So uh, I'll just, I'll say a couple of things and I wanna let, give Monica a chance to weigh in here, but you know, reducing the parking, the parking that's embedded in the housing is the way to go. There was one, one of the projects that I showed had a kind of strip of surface parking along the train tracks. And if that was permanent, that could be terrible. But if, but it, what if it, if what they did was they made housing that didn't have the cost of accommodating cars in the building, that's where that sort of, you know, five, 10, 15, 20% construction cost savings can come from get the cars out of the building, the design buildings for humans and not for cars and put the cars over there. And to Monica's point, if over time you had, you know, 300 surface parking lots that eventually goes to zero and all of that land gets built on, then the cost of construction just went down. So that, and, and you know, a lot of times the public process, the, the neighbors, people, lovely people on this call who are, are nodding and agreeing, yeah, we park too much at TUDs. If it's coming into your neighborhood, you step up and oppose it. Say, this is gonna be a problem. There's gonna be spillover parking. There'll be parking in front of my house. You gotta build more parking. What, to which I would say, don't build it in the building. Build it on a corner of the site. And if three years, the parking lot's vacant because you really didn't use it, build the, build the next building and the land came for free. So it's that's part of it. And then the idea, and you know this, I mean, to put you know an elevator building on the, on the bigger streets and then some townhouses and some missing middle in the middle of the site uh, is not, it's not a big cost premium. So um, that's just silly. And so the other thing that's true is, you know, we haven't talked about equity yet. Um, the, the idea of using missing middle housing types, the two, you know, two to six unit building can be done by smaller developers. And I think that's actually a good thing. It creates wealth for a lot more people. Uh, there are examples around the country of, What's, there's a movement called the Incremental Developers Forum, and they are getting uh, developers of color, African American, Latino developers who build a three unit building, you know, and they spend a year doing it, and maybe the family or the crews, and there's family wealth created that way, as opposed to, you know, some massive uh, stock exchange traded housing, you know, org, org. Uh, kind of extruding more of the same uh, on a site near you. So, you know, I, that's also a consideration we haven't talked about. So, but I, let me shut up and let Monica say something smart. <laughs> well, before she does, I just want to say, you just, you just earned your fee tonight, Doug. <laughs> Actually, I'm joking. Doug gets no fee tonight, but um, if I'm I getting were, a drink out of you, I'm getting a yeah, drink. Yeah, if, if I were paying you for this gig, you just earned it because you made several of the points that I think folks here are, are really going to resonate with. And um, I wanna just echo loud and clear what Doug said, take the parking out to make it possible to do the other good stuff that actually makes for a place. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, I just was gonna say that anything design related, you know, it's okay, Doug, if you just if you just take the right because I'm here to just offer the transit perspective. And in um just two pieces, we we do have parking management guidelines, right? So different things that can be done, you know, instead of having parking and different ways you can get, you know, points essentially for doing some different parking management. So like 
doing a shared mobility program. Um, you know, uh, it, you know, it, this is more than just like yes, no parking, right? There's this gray area. There's these other levers. So that's also something that's available on our website that would be interesting to look at. Um, and I lost my other point, so I'll just I'll just stop there. Um, and you have more because I've got uh, about two hours worth of questions here that I don't want to hold our speakers oh. terribly late for, but I'd like to kind of just run through quickly so that uh, you know, at least we get a little bit more covered. Um, Dave, uh, Dave plays inside baseball a lot. So I, he says, Doug may know fellow CNU member Steve Coyle. Steve is of the strong opinion that TOD and cities such as Petaluma can, can't be financially feasible over about three stories. Is there a path to making taller buildings more feasible? Uh, we love Steve Coyle, and I'm glad you mentioned his name because it makes me happy just to hear it. Thank you, Dave. So Steve's just, uh, just amazing. So um, I totally respect what Steve said, and the chart that I showed with the kind of matrix um, acknowledges a fundamental truth about what Steve said, which is stick frame uh, construction is about the cheapest thing going. So um, for the construction, but when you think about land and that we aren't making more land and we want more units closer to the center, closer to the transit and so on. So, um, you know, the building codes make it easy to build sort of a three, sometimes four story buildings. Then you have to go to fireproof construction for the ground floor, sometimes two time, two stories. Um, the Pacific Northwest, north of y'all, um, particularly in Washington state is pioneering the kind of use of, what do they call it, super wood? Um, you can do wood frame buildings at, you know, four and five, sometimes six stories. So it's the Steve Coyle meets the Steve Coyle criteria of still, you know, stick built. They're just thicker sticks. Um, and so um, I would just say when you look at land value overall, uh, Steve's still right. But I think you, when you factor in land value and say it's pretty expensive because it's a good central location, we should use it intensively. So um, but I think the bigger factor there is just get the damn cars out of the building. And that goes a long way. So uh, I'm rushed or got rush of comment things in the comments to me, but Heather's got her hand up and Heather gets to jump the queue because of who she is. Go for it, Heather. Well, I'm actually here just as Heather. So excellent. Um, well, that's why I took my background off. Um, I just I there's a couple things that you said that I in I completely agree with. But yet, uh, and I am a planner with the city, we continue to bang our head against the wall to try to get traction on things that you're bringing up. So we have begged developers to go taller. And we have zoning districts where we don't have a maximum density. Um, and we can't, you know, get it. We have offered parking reductions and it is a constant fight um, that that oftentimes we end up losing because we don't have the teeth to say you can't and we kind of are in this constant battle and some of the people on this know that battle happens others don't and only see the final product and don't kind of understand sometimes how the sausage is made if you will but for instance, like one of the projects you put up there also, it is 100% affordable to low and very low and includes 25% supportive housing units. I mean, so we are also desperate for those, those units. And so we get in a push pull and I will say, we did get a, a there there, a community space. It's not huge. It maybe isn't, you know, everything we would have wanted, but the final design of that project ended up doing that. Um, and then just one thing, and then I'll be quiet. The other thing we're constantly dealing with is the state regulations that we have to struggle with. So if you come in and you have a certain amount of affordability, we don't get to have a, a public hearing we don't notice we and all we can hold a developer to is you know do you meet the minimum setbacks do you you know all of our objective standards so it's i just kind of want to highlight some of those things that are really challenging and it's not often a lack of trying 
Heather, that was great. I love, you can lower your hand now. So uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm raising my hand out of affinity. So um, you must, you must be a revered planner. So you, you who needed no uh, introduction. So thank you. So I am sure, you know, planners take a beating. They look unbruised, but you know, I'm sure underneath Heather's hat or, you know, whatever, um, she's been beaten up by people. So, you know, I think couple, everyone knows that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a, a couple considerations. So, you know, the new urbanism has, uh, you know, a couple things to try. I'm sure you probably tried them. So, but they're worth mentioning. One is, um, you know, your codes. I don't know what your zoning codes are like, but, you know, there's a, been a movement since 1980. So 41 years worth uh, called form-based codes and it's the idea we were the first city in the nation to adopt a form-based code well yeah. then i'm just better hang up the phone that's pretty impressive so it is impressive um, yeah but but with that comes the is there a is there a fast track and a slow track so um you know if the fast track you know if you build a six-story building you get your entitlements in a week you want to build a three-story building that'll be two years uh, you know, that's, that's the trick. So like make the, the fast path, the one you want and developers here, you know, translate time into money. You know, the, the math is pretty easy, um, how they're making less money because it's going slower. So, so, uh, I don't know what, what multiple paths to approval there are under your code, but that would be one. And then the second is, I don't know, I don't know California, but I know, um, I have a sense that probably Petaluma is isolated enough that, you know, I don't know who, where it would draw developers from. I don't know what's nearby. I don't know city names, but like you could be pretty insular. You have the same four or six or eight, or, or do you get nationals? I don't know what you get. So, but yeah. recruiting from the outside. And, you know, for Monica, one of, one of the, I think it was a BART project at MacArthur BART um with that developer came to town and we didn't you know they ended up leaving town but we did not get anything like you got at macarthur bart and not for a lack of trying and we did that same thing we we were pushing them to like okay you have this big parking garage show me that you can transition that to something else when nobody wants to park because nobody has a car because you're right next to our amazing train station but so that kind of like how, how'd you get them to do something really cool? And what we got from them was kind of a sterile box with kind of suburban add-ons at the ground floor. Um, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have an answer for that. I, I think that we're a little unique, right? In being that we are, you know, both leasing the land and the HJ and, and we are outside of, what the, some of the cities and counties are doing, right? Yeah. You know, the yeah. special, you know, regulations that apply just to BART. Um, you talk to some people around MacArthur, though, they hate that building, right? They're like, that's way taller than everything else around it. How dare BART do that, right? So, like, it kind of goes to Doug's point that, you know, once you talk about doing development near where people live, you're, you're going to get a lot of pushback from the community. Yeah. Hey, Thank Heather. you. Heather, yeah. question back to you. So, um, have you are, have there been examples in Petaluma where you've illustrated the kind of ideal that you're talking about, the you know denser, diverse, mixed use thing, and it's laid out there. And you know, if I were a developer, if if a denser option that I could still make money at had already been through the community process and the politicians had endured the brain it, brain damage to overcome the nimbyism. And that my path to quicker building was the denser one. And then there's basically take a number, you know, get in line four years to build townhouses here. You know, developers will respond to that. So, but it requires this upfront investment of, of having a vision, running it through the process and having the NIMBY fight before the developer gets yeah. there, right? Because yeah. I mean, you can say all the nice things. Yeah, we want it denser, but they know like, well-intentioned people on this call are going to say, I don't want to, I don't want my house shaded. Right. Our stories right. is a tower, you know, heaven forbid, I moved to Petaluma to get away from that. You know, I can, yeah. I can, we don't want those people. I did, moved here not to get away from that. All the kind of language that we've heard over the years about, yeah. you know, 
Maybe it's, yeah. So I'll and show. we have a beautiful, Opticos did a beautiful stationary master plan in our downtown area. I mean, it's it's lovely. It's It's got beautiful illustrations. You know, we have our form-based code. You know, I think the highest we go anywhere in the city, and it's a very small amount, goes to six stories, but we have not, and I think, I think the tallest we've had is four and a partial five um, that has has been approved. And actually Haystack was one of the ones that ended up kind of the layout was as as our stationary master plan showed it. Um, so maybe some of the architectural detailing, but the but the layout of it and stuff was very close to what that stationary master plan laid out for that that site and that and that project. So, so one last thought because I I feel the love for Heather and you know sorry about your injuries, um, but you know <laughs> one of the things that we I I believe is true is you know your your no your position is no stronger than your mayor and and what your mayor and council and you know plan commission zone commission whatever feel in their hearts right and so if they have they aren't convinced of it they won't you know stand up to a NIMBY that's screaming loud you know so i don't know uh we have taken several rounds of clients on on travel junkets to go see the good project you know in another state you know and so it's it's a little bit of an allocation some thousands of dollars um but there have been no scandals in hotel rooms or anything like that. Uh, and they see the place and they kind of like, oh, I get it. You know, that kind of works. You know, we didn't have that in our community, but I can see that that would work. And so it's a kind of uh, con human connection grounded to a pilgrimage site. They took a trip. They got on their knees and climbed the last hundred yards up the hill and saw something spiritual, whatever. So, um, you know, uh, changing hearts and minds, you know, comes in a lot of forms. Leave it yeah. at that. Thank you for coming tonight. It's been very interesting and great to hear both of your perspectives. Heather, I didn't actually go anywhere. Well, you you but joined yeah, us, you know, and it's yeah. it's even later there. Yes, yes, it so. is. Um, and do you? Uh, so I my chat window is full of a gazillion things but I think some of them are more suited to discussions of future forums. We clearly need to have a parking forum again. Um, we have some questions about the specifics of smart, which I don't know, smart stations, which I doubt Monica can answer that uh, clearly. Um, yeah, and I'm just distracted by it scrolling by here and I need to save it off so that we can talk about these things for planning. Um, and, and, but I definitely don't want to keep you all too late. And do you have anything more? Or should we, uh, say thank you? And well, I do have, um, I've, I've still got a number, but maybe Take it I'll... away and keep it going as long as you want to, we still have 45 <laughs> participants, so, you know, <laughs> so, well, I think, you know, as, as I think we started off by saying, this is all about our opportunity to influence the general plan. So. I will ask, I've got a question for each of you. Monica, my question is, you know, in your, at BART's interactions with cities, so you sit in the transit agency seat and you work with cities. Is there anything from your vantage point there that you might advise us as concerned and active residents to, you know, messages to carry to our city leaders that um, can influence these projects for the better. Um, when we, you know, are dealing with uh, the travel, the transit agency, or anything that you also hear in your work with the public that you find particularly compelling or persuasive. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the main piece is you know how do you come out showing that you have this transit supportive regulation right so how you know when you're looking at the general plan you know how, can you put pieces in there on parking decoupling it you know are these these different things that you can as a city adopt you know make heather's job easier because then it's you know that's that's how it's moving forward right because you know, like I mentioned before, like we have the authority to um, develop 
any of our parking lots as we see fit, but we choose to start with the ones that are in cities that have these supportive, you know, transit supportive regulations already in place. You know, because we assume that, you know, to Doug's point, they have a supportive mayor, they have a supportive city council. And then to that too, I just want to say, you know, BART's board, at least our current board, is very supportive of, of TOD, like to the point where, you know, I'm one of my big projects is trying to do electric vehicle charging at our stations. And I have to be very clear that I am not going to be putting state charging stations where TOD might go. Like they don't want anything getting in the way of TOD. And so, you know, it goes to the point that when you have the right um, support that it, it's, it's going to help these projects move faster. Well, that's a wonderful, thank you so much, Monica. And it's actually the perfect segue to my question for Doug. And this goes back, Doug, to the preface of uh, sustainable urbanism, where you wrote, all sustainability is local. So how significant might this audience be in shaping what life is like in Petaluma and our success in meeting our climate equity and sustainability goals 10 years hence in oh. local action? You know, I hate people that write out their questions. They're so thoughtful and they citations and stuff like that. So um, I hate you, Anne Edminster, <laughs> but, um, but you know, so this is, I, I don't know the names and I don't know the folks on this call, but I could, I get some sense that it's a committed populace. And this, these are, you all are leaders of some sort because you're spending your evening what not binge watching something and you're here with an eye to making Petaluma better. So that's number one. I don't know if there's any kind of tech retirees here that have the $20 million in an in a onshore account that want to become developers. But I think if you, I mean, if you, that's honestly, it's sort of, I say to people that say, I want to become an architect. Why don't you consider something else? Why don't you become a mayor or a developer? Those are my two things. So, because they have power. And you know, city council, yes. Zoning commission, yes. How many people on this call are on plan or zoning commission? Anybody? Quite a few. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Love you, love you. Keep it up. Um, but so you're in a position of power. You're gatekeepers. Um, you know, it sounds like you've had some of the good consultants, and you know, lovely. Um, but you know, I will just say it's it's, and I know Monica knows this, and I our other friend, the planner. Um, Heather knows this, but you're no, you're no better than the average member of your community. You know, if, if the, the Jane or the Joe you stop on the street doesn't kind of get it or hasn't heard about it, ooh, that's pretty bad. So it's, you know, there's no, no end of education. So that's one. Um, I, you know, I go back to, you know, I'll just say, as a person who's part of my day job is doing plans, uh, you know, plans can be lovely and plans can mostly miss, fly over the heads of a lot of people. You know, when we do municipal plans, we are lucky when the number of people we engage is exceeds two or 3% of the population of a municipality. So that means 97% weren't there and 90% didn't hear about it. And so, you know, when the, when you hold the public meeting and the, the people come out with the, the burning torches and so on. That's to be expected. So I know just what do you do about that? So I'm gonna go on a since since we're maybe ending early, I'm gonna keep going for a couple of minutes. So in Chicago, you know, we had um, the first so-called um, modern plan was prepared here in Chicago in 1909 by an architect named Daniel Burnham. And it was the Chicago called the Chicago Plan, commissioned by the Commercial Club of Chicago. Uh, and it was, you know, a bunch of white guys with suspenders and cigars. Uh, up in, you know, taller buildings, looking down at the city and making plans. So it was, you know, pretty top down stuff, but it was thoughtful and it was, it had illustrations, it was visionary. Um, and then famously, this is the coolest part that people maybe don't know. In 1925, I think he was head of the plan commission, a guy named Charles Wacker, um, published something called the Wacker Manual. And what it did was taught to eighth graders in the Chicago public schools, taught them as a mandatory part of the curriculum, the Chicago plan. It was a plan for a public lakefront. It was a plan for 
a transit system. There's a plan for, you know, modern uh, plumbing and sewage treatment and health facilities. And, and every eighth grader in Chicago for, I'm not, I'm a Detroiter, so this is, I wasn't part of it, but, you know, for about 50 years, every Chicagoan in eighth grade learned the plan. Like, you want to talk about sort of deep penetration, that would be cool for Petaluma to do that. So make that investment, translate these ideas down a generation or a decade or two younger than anybody on this call and let plant that seed because that would be the kind of the most powerful thing you could do. So, and the kids have a way of talking about, well, there are some kids go to school and you have no idea what they do all day, but there are other kids that bring it home and say, you won't believe what we were talking about. So it's crazy stuff, you know, this planning stuff and parking and, you know, and the parents can learn from the kids. So, so I, that would be maybe the kind of part of history from Chicago that I'd like to share just as a kind of, it was like a 50 year investment. And uh, so the, and the other thing to say, the Burnham plan after 112 years uh, is now considered to be about 35% complete. 112 years, 35% complete. So, you know, um, we have a couple projects that we started like Uptown Normal, it's about two thirds done. I'm really happy. It's only been you know, 22 years, it's like lightning, right? So, you know, <clears throat> thank God everybody on this call is young. Um, except for those people who have their cameras off, who I think are hiding something. I don't know what's going on with that. Um, and I do want to meet Steve Bertelbau because I love your last name, Steve. Um, I, I, I wonder what a Bertelbau looks like. So um, but anyway, so just we're an older. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bertelbau. Good evening. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Looking good, brother. Looking good. Um, but, you know, we're an older class. You know, we're, we're geeks. We're into this stuff. So but get the kids involved. Maybe that'll be my closing thing. But I would just say aim high. Like, what else are you going to do in your life? What legacy are you going to leave? Are you going to let sort of mediocre things happen to your town? And I appreciate that uh, I got some of these things wrong. The projects had social virtues beyond their physical form that I didn't know about. So um, granted, but, but aim high. Like, what else are you going to do that's more important? So leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. And you just earned your fee all over again <laughs> by talking about education, which is uh, really another huge cornerstone of my practice. So awesome. Um, I'm going to run and show you something, but give me one minute. Oh, okay. Very good. Um, Dan, in the meantime, do we have anybody else waiting in the wings who would like to uh, add a final comment or question oh jeepers i mean i you know i'm i've been trying to keep up with all of the chat and the comments and i'm going to be dissecting these things all deeply afterwards and yes for everybody who's asked what happens about the spill with the spillover parking um if you don't have enough parking in your development and how do we process that we are definitely we had a, a forum at delavatoria with a protege of don Shoup, and if you have not read Don's amazing book. Well, neither has anybody else, but the first chapter is available for free online and it's well worth a read. Um, and we'll we'll do a follow up on on parking and uh, I've got some people who are interested in design. So I think I might have some people who can share future uh, meetings. Anyway, Doug's back. <laughs> so I just, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see this, but it's a very <laughs> advanced, very advanced tool. <clears throat> excuse me, in our office called the Urban Design Name Generator. And so <laughs> uh, when we were chairing, and this goes back to lead ND days, we oh my figured gosh. out we had 238 case studies from around the world. And Elliot Allen, if you remember Elliot from Portland, yeah. kind of did a database and figured out um, there were like the same words were used over and over in all the titles. So <laughs> somebody in my office made this. And so if you don't know what to call your project, North Arbor Center, spelled C N T L E. Bella Station Common, Old Vista Square, Midtown Circle Place, Old Plaza Place, and so so, which is to say, very little we do is that 
creative. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, maybe we need to invent the new version of that that's, uh, that is creative. Word scramble, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so, Dan, um, you mentioned a chapter of a book. Is that something you could put on to the you Know Before You Grow page? I, I, I will ask Sharon to put a citation on there. Yeah, the um, book is The High Cost of Free Parking. And uh, if you are interested in this topic and haven't at least read the first, after about chapter seven is just beating the horse over and over again. <laughs> But the, but the uh, uh, it's well worth at least reading the free intro uh, online. And if anybody wants to borrow it, I think it's still on my shelf if it hasn't been, gone off to other places yet. Wonderful. And um, so I understand this session's been recorded and will be posted. But do we also post our presenters' slide decks? We would love to post our presenters' slide decks. And I have been not as good about linking to them once Sharon puts them on the website as I should be. But yes, if you want to email them to uh, Anne or me or Sharon, I, we will make sure that they get posted. And I will get off my butt and put those resources in the YouTube comments. And we will, of course, post this to YouTube. And push it as widely as possible. And we will also all go buy Doug's book from Copperfields because that's the right thing to do. Fabulous. Thank you, Dan. Yes. I do want to say that we have we do have the, the book posted on our resources page. So they're listed by forum date, but also by um, just an alpha listing of the books. So you can find it on our resources page. Wonderful. And so if our presenters would be kind enough to provide their presentations in PDF, We'd be most grateful. And if you don't wish to, that's uh, perfectly permissible as well. So thanks once again to Monica and to Doug and hope you all enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thanks for joining us tonight, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to copy off the chat and uh, <laughs> we'll see you all next meeting. Thank cool. you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Bye bye. This was great. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful.